Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Literature Festival, Jaipur Literature Festival's British Airways Baithak. Uh, can we have everyone seated somewhere or standing on the sides? Thank you. Uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival would like to thank their uh, sponsor, the wonderful sponsors, Google, Ford, Mahindra Humanity Center, and British Airways. Uh, please keep your phones on silent mode. And uh, if, if in case you have an emergency conversation, please go outside and uh, do so. Flash photography is strictly prohibited. Uh, please help us keep the venue clean. Uh, we request you. If you have any litter, there's dustbins outside, so carry it along once you're going out. Uh, you can tweet on uh, hashtag ZJLF. We have some merchandise stores. Uh, please help us. Please help the festival support the merchandise stores. There's Full Circle. There's some NGOs we support. Uh, Umang, Help in Suffering, Himjoli, Frame Book, uh, Radha Swami, Satsang Bias. Also, we have fantastic uh, evening concert at uh, Clark Samir. If anyone wants to join, you can ask the information at uh, the information desk. We're delighted to introduce The Forgotten Alley, The Making of Modern China. Please welcome Rana Mitter, introduced by Carlos Rojas, presented by Rajasthan Patrika. Hello, thank you. My name's Carlos Rojas. Um, so we often think of World War I as a European war, but we often forget that uh, approximately 120,000 Chinese fought in Europe uh, in the war, about 90,000 in Britain and uh, 30,000 in France. And of those, between 10 and 20,000 lost their lives. Um, they didn't fight, they were working behind the, um, behind the lines, but uh, deeply involved in the war effort. Um, we often forget that in the Spanish Civil War, which was a prelude to World War II, uh, there were approximately 100 Chinese soldiers that fought in the International Brigade. Um, and this was actually only came to life uh, about 10 years ago, more than half a century after the fact. Um, uh, at the same time that the Spanish Civil War was going on, there was, of course, another um, conflict half a world away the Chinese resistance to the Japanese invasion. Um, and the book that we'll be looking at today argues that that conflict too has been in large part forgotten. Uh, at first glance, that might seem like a strange claim to make given that it was the enormity of the conflict, 14 million people lost their lives, 80 million refugees, um, but Professor Rana Mitter ar ar argues that the um, conflict and the significance of China's resistance to Japan was forgotten in two respects. Um, first, he argues that by, in large part, we've, we have forgotten the role that the conflict has played in shaping modern China. We think of the role of the communists, um, but forget about the, the transformative role that this uh, uh, war played. Um, and secondly, we forget that the significance of the conflict in shaping the overall uh, outcome of the war itself, the role of, that, of the four years that China played in resisting Japan almost uh, unilaterally, and then the next four years that China played um, in fighting Japan and helping to um, allow the allies to uh, fight two, uh, uh, two conflicts um, in Europe and Asia simultaneously. Um, his book uh, revolves around three main figures, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and a third, Wang Qingsheng. Um, uh, Wang Qingwei. Wang Qingwei, I'm sorry. Um, Wang Qingsheng is a completely different person. Um, uh, all of them uh, ambitious, strategically brilliant, and with similar but yet quite distinct visions of 
uh, the fate, uh, the fate that they wanted for modern China. Um, at the same time, he sketches a uh, detailed panoramic uh, description of the um, human element of this uh, uh, eight years of, of civil conflict, of, of, of military conflict, the suffocating uh, oppressive conditions in air raid shelters, young women having to give up their children to peasants, um, uh, uh, the act of uh, sifting through goose droppings for grains of edible wheat uh, for people uh, perishing from famine. Um, I could go on and on, but he will speak to you about his book himself. Let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Rana Mitter. He's Professor of History and Politics at Modern China, fellow at St. Cross College, University of Oxford. Um, he's written uh, four books, uh, Modern China, A Very Short History, 2008, A Bitter Revolution, China's Struggle with the Modern World, 2004, The Manchurian Myth, Nationalism, Resistance and Collaboration in Modern China, 2000. Um, He's the principal investigator for an inter interdisciplinary research project on China's war with Japan, uh, funded by the Le Leverhulme Research Award, um, which helped generate, among other things, the book that we'll be speaking to you today, um, uh, 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 Forgotten Ally, um, China's War of Resistance uh, Against Japan. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rana Mitter. Carlos, thank you very much for that very gracious introduction, and thank you all so much for joining us here this afternoon. I hope you'll enjoy, uh, as well as have something to think about in terms of this talk, and there's going to be time at the end for questions or comments that anyone has as well. I'm going to start by hoping that the technology is functioning and that I can call up one or two images that may help me with my talk today. So fingers crossed, everyone. Here we go. I wonder if that image could be flashed up on screen. Is that clear? <laughs> Not very. Yep. You're still seeing me, which I think is probably a bad thing as, uh, as these things go. Probably far too clearly. Ah, there we are. Now, I'm afraid this picture is not terribly distinct. It may have been taken by a photographer who had one or two um, uh, um, drinks before uh, snapping it. But I think if you screw up your eyes, you can just make out three pretty central figures of the 20th century. Um, in the center, of course, none other than Mahatma Gandhi. Um, on the left-hand side, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader of China through much of the early 20th century. And to the right, indeed to most people's right, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Kai Sung Mei Ling, the longtime consort and also a very impressive political brain in her own right. And this meeting took place just outside Calcutta in February of 1942, as part of a visit that was both a signal failure and I think one of the most important meetings in terms of the reshaping of world order, both at the same time. Because the meeting in February 1942 happened just two months after a very signal and world famous event, the Japanese attack on American naval ships in Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, an act, as I'm sure you're all aware, brought the United States together into the war with the British Empire, including, of course, India, and with the Republic of China, the other country that had already been fighting in Asia for four and a half years by that stage. And Chiang Kai-shek, the then Chinese leader, made it really insisted on one particular point very early on in his alliance with the British and the Americans, that he, Chang, should fly in quite dangerous conditions across the hump, as it was called, from wartime China into eastern India to meet with the major Indian independence leaders, a whole variety of them, but most notably Nehru, who was actually an old friend of his, and Gandhi, who he did not know well. The meeting, it has to be said, was mixed in terms of its immediate results. Chiang Kai-shek was not just playing a friendly, paying a friendly visit to India in the midst of the Second World War, at a time when his own country of China was under siege from the Japanese. He hoped to persuade the Congress leaders and the other leaders of the independence movement that they should throw India's weight wholeheartedly 
behind the British Empire effort against the Japanese in Asia, something which ultimately, of course, should be rewarded by independence for India itself. Meetings with Nehru were cordial, although Nehru and Chiang didn't ultimately see eye to eye on that particular question. The meeting with Gandhi, although it was uh, a subject of some negotiation, was more problematic. First of all, then Prime Minister of Britain, Winston Churchill, made it very clear that he was not enthusiastic that such a meeting should take place. He had always had something of an allergy against Gandhi, who he regarded as a fraud and a fakir, and probably various other words beginning with F, which we will not say in this august, <laughs> august company. But at the same time, he was also, in his own terms, justifiably worried that one of the issues that Chang would raise was not just collaboration with the Indian army, but also the prospect of Indian independence, something to which Churchill, of course, was very much opposed. Nonetheless, after wrangling and insistence, the meeting did take place, and you see one of the pictures, in fact, um, here, uh, just outside um, Calcutta. However, after five hours of talks, which were interpreted by Madame Chiang Kai-shek, the only person there who spoke both English and Chinese, of course, um, the meeting ultimately broke down. Both sides found it difficult to find any meeting point. Chiang Kai-shek, of course, a man who had grown up in the warlord culture of China and who found violence was often the only method which he could use to uh, further his political goals. And of course, Gandhi, the ultimate um, uh, advocate of nonviolent resistance. In the end, in his diary, uh, in the end, Gandhi ended the meeting in a rather traditional way for him by turning to his spinning wheel, starting to uh, weave cotton cloth and closing off the conversation there and then, leading Chang to write in his diary shortly afterwards that he felt, in his words, that Gandhi's heart had been hardened against the entry into the war uh, against the Japanese, whereas Gandhi himself wrote a little later to Vallabhai Patel, there was nothing I could learn from, from him, and I don't think there was anything that we could teach him either. So not exactly a meeting of minds in that particular case. And yet it was an important moment for a different reason. This was one of the first, if not the first moments, when a non-European, non-white power stood at the forefront of this global wartime alliance. Even if China, as I will go on to say, was in many ways not treated as a truly equal ally in the war effort, along with the British, the Soviets, and the Americans, at least in official terms, in rhetoric, and in some of the official planning, China was given equal rather than colonial standing in terms of its place in the war effort. And therefore, one can make an argument, which isn't often heard, I think, that the era of anti-imperialist, nationalist, and uh, decolonization that emerges and shapes so much of the third part of the 20th century began not just with Indian independence, not just with Chairman Mao's revolution in China, but earlier than that, in the war efforts made by nationalist China with communist allies in the fight against the Axis powers during World War II. In other words, I want to make two points, as Carlos, I think, has already alluded to in the course of the, uh, the talk today. The first is a reminder of the fact that when we speak about the Allied effort in World War II, China was very much one of those allies, and yet for reasons I shall go on to talk about, it is an ally whose role has very largely been forgotten, not just in the West, not just in India, but actually until recently in China itself. And then the second point, the consequence, I think is also worth thinking about, which is, put starkly, the war against Japan between 1937 and 45 one could argue the longest stretch of resistance of any power during World War II, was the making of modern China, the China that we see today in the year 2014. And therefore, this talk is about China and its history, but it's also about China today and the way that it shapes our wider world. For instance, just take a brief look at today's China. If you read the newspapers or hear the news, you'll know that some of the most pressing problems, as well as uh, policy 
prerogatives, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, policy priorities in China today are to do with welfare issues, to do with pensions, to do with health care, to do with state education, particularly with a population that is getting older because of the one-child policy, but also is overall getting healthier, more literate, and better nourished, if not necessarily entirely freer in terms of individual rights. But that is a dilemma which does not originate in the last 10 or 20 or even 50 years in China. The events of over 70 years ago during the Second World War and the fight against the Japanese were also central to forcing the political establishment of China to move from a situation of wartime deprivation and desperation to the building of a welfare-driven solidarity. We associate the final culmination of that policy, of course, with Mao, the communists, and Deng Xiaoping, and the modern China after that. But the process did not begin with them. It began under the half-forgotten, generally poorly rated, nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. In other words, between China's pre-communist past and present, there is, of course, radical, violent change, but there is also continuity. And the war against the Japanese, the Second World War in China, is one of the keys to understanding that continuity as well as change. So I've mentioned that a great deal of the changing understanding of China's recent history comes in a reassessment of the man you see on the left-hand side in this, I'm afraid, slightly fuzzy image, Chiang Kai-shek, the generalissimo, as he had himself known. And here's someone who has not generally had a very good press from scholars or from wider public understanding in the past few decades. But I'm hoping to suggest that trends within China itself, this is quite separate from the Western view or the view from the rest of the world, trends from within the People's Republic itself have seriously reassessed many aspects of the achievements as well as the failures of the pre-communist government. And this means we have moved a long way, and I think rightly, from the rather sterile questions asked on both sides during the Cold War. On the Western side, the classic question asked by the American McCarthyites was, who lost China? A meaningless question since China was never America's or anyone else's to lose in the first place. Instead, we ask, I think, a more fruitful question today. Why did the war change China, and what is its legacy today? Avoiding questions of blame, which I think are not necessarily for historians, and instead looking for causes. So in other words, I want to suggest that China's role as the forgotten ally in World War II is profoundly important in shaping the China of today. Let me say a few words about the government of Chiang Kai-shek in the years and months leading up to the outbreak of war with Japan in the 1930s. And again, there may be many experts here in Chinese history, others who don't have much background in it, so forgive me if I'm telling you things that you know. But essentially, Chiang, after launching a military campaign against the warlords who controlled much of China in the late 1920s, created a fitful and partial reunification and modernization of China between 1937, sorry, 27, 28, and 1937, with his new capital in the eastern Chinese city of Nanjing. Now, the price of this unification was very heavy, not least the sudden and quite treacherous slaughter of many of his communist allies who had fought beside him in the 1920s. And the government that was in power under Chiang Kai-shek in the city of Nanjing, formerly known under its alternative Western name of Nanking, was in many ways not a very lovable entity, known for massive corruption, inability to solve a real um, agricultural rural crisis, um, committer of huge numbers of human rights abuses, torture, extra legal executions, all of that sort of thing. These are the indictments thrown at the nationalist government at the time, also known as the Guomindang or Kuomintang, for those of you who have seen that romanization. And these indictments are, I think, very much merited. However, recent scholarship has begun to look at the other side of the coin. They noticed that nationalist China's foreign ministry, under some quite skilled, often Western-trained diplomats, 
was able to achieve a whole variety of changes in China's condition. After the Opium Wars of the 1840s, China had spent decades with no autonomy to choose its own import and export tax rates, tariff rates. It's a slightly dry sounding subject, but it's of great importance in terms of any country's tax revenue. The nationalists managed to get those rights back from the Western powers in 1930. Um, and um, other uh, issues, the, um, uh, uh, the government also used effectively customs revenues and a whole variety of other areas to modernize the transport infrastructure of China. Some 20,000 miles of railways, for, uh, of roads, uh, no sorry, of railways, 40,000 miles of roads were modernized and built in China during those 10 years. And most importantly, and something that's often been laid as a source of blame at the government in China in terms of the war against Japan, was that they did secretly, but seriously begin to prepare for a war against the Japanese. From as early as 1932, after the invasion of Manchuria in northeast China by the Japanese, the Chinese National Resources Commission was beginning to make plans for a long-term war of resistance against Japan. And yet, the question of Japan was probably the one that hung most dangerously across the China of that era. Whatever else, in terms of modernization, gaining back tariff rights from the Western powers, Britain and France happened, Japan was rising in the 20s, 30s, as an imperialist and increasingly aggressive power as it threw off democracy and became much more militarized, convinced that its destiny lay in conquering and subduing the mainland of Asia, and in particular, China, during this period. Relations between Japan and China then as now were not uncomplicated. Many Japanese educators, many Japanese thinkers came to China and did excellent work. I've said in my book that Japan was mentor as well as monster to the Chinese during this time, and both of those factors are true. But at the same time, the rising tide of militarism meant that war between the two sides became more and more inevitable as the 30s moved on. And finally, the clash occurred. On the 7th of July, 1937, local Japanese and Chinese troops clashed outside Beijing, then known as Beiping, as it happened, about 20 miles from the center, near a bridge known as the Marco Polo Bridge, because the explorer Marco Polo had supposedly written and remarked about it during his uh, travels to China. And this small clash, in this dusty village on the outskirts of uh, Beijing, which wasn't even, of course, the capital of China at that time, would escalate within days and months into all-out war between the two biggest nations of East Asia. Before it ended, very suddenly, in August 1945, with the atomic bombings of Japan, the war would see some 14 million or more Chinese deaths, some, uh, depending how you count it, 80 to 100 million Chinese becoming refugees, and the heart ripped out of this painful and flawed modernization that was happening in fits and starts in the 1930s. The war would also destroy two empires in China, the British Empire, which did have a hold there, and of course, the Japanese as well. It would help to create two more, the American and the Soviet. And during that time, very large parts of China's sense of its own identity would be reshaped forever. So let me give you a quick look at the geography of this conflict. During the eight years of the war from 1937 to 1945, the China's center, China's center of gravity would move in a very profound way. The capital, as I mentioned, if you look at the east side of the map, I'm sorry, the letters are a bit small perhaps to read from the back, but the city of Nanjing on the um, eastern, uh, not quite coast, but near the east coast was of course the capital in peacetime. And during the first months of the war, the Japanese invaded, occupied most of the east part of China with their collaborators, forcing the center of Chinese resistance in two directions, a communist dominated area to the north and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government relocating in the interior with its capital in the southwestern city of Chongqing, or Chongqing, as it was known in the West at the time. Nationalist and communist troops continued, both of them, to resist the Japanese. At the height of the war, let's say in 1942, these were essentially the only 
Asian troops anywhere in East Asia resisting the Japanese onslaught. And their importance in that sense has never, I think, been fully recognized. They could not defeat the Japanese on their own. Let's be clear about that. Only the American entry into the war in 1941 would turn that tide. And from 1942, China was an ally alongside the US and the UK, yet the alliance was uncertain. It was very, very flawed and toxic. And China's own government, the nationalist government, became weaker and more corrupt. And by the end of the war, close to collapse. So much of the action that I'm going to talk about in more detail in just a minute or two takes place in, if you look at the sort of the center of the map, the southwest to central part of China, this is where most of the nationalist resistance took place during that uh, time. And if you look at the map also, you'll see that geographically, we're talking about the region closest to India. The flight from Western China across Burma into India became one of the most important supply routes and diplomatic routes, uh, in a sense, during the years of the war against the Japanese. So the indictments against Chinese resistance are many, and I'll mention some of those, but I want you to listen to them with the following thought in mind. History, at this point, could have been very different. In 1938, a year after the invasion of China by Japan, the most logical thing for Chiang Kai-shek and the communists indeed, but Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists in particular, as the recognized, internationally recognized government of China, the most logical thing would have been for them to surrender to the Japanese. The Japanese were probably given some kind of quite favorable collaborationist deal because Chiang was a prestigious figure in Asia at the time. And that would have meant that East Asia would essentially have been under Japanese control, not just in 1938, but for a generation or two afterwards. There would no longer have been an easy occasion for a war with the West. The Japanese could have turned their attention north to the Soviet Union or west into British India. Certainly, the British authorities were very worried about this. As we know very well, these scenarios did not happen. But one of the reasons they didn't happen, a significant reason, was the continued resistance of China from 1938 onward. And as I say, I'm often surprised that that story isn't better known. So I'm not, beyond this, going to give the entire trajectory of the war. You'll be glad to uh, hear, I'm sure, in the space of the 20 minutes or so that we, uh, we have now. They are, the events are more detailed in my book, China's War with Japan, which deals with a whole variety of the horrors that befell China during this period. Perhaps the most notorious, the Rape of Nanking, the Nanjing Massacre undertaken by the Japanese troops which invaded the Chinese nationalist capital in December 1937, leading to tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of deaths. I'm not gonna talk about Chiang Kai-shek's horrific decision to burst the dams on the Yellow River, to flood much of central China, thereby stopping the Japanese advance, but at a terrible price for some half a million of his own people. I'm not gonna talk in any detail about the 1942 famine in Henan, which took place almost at the same time as the Bengal famine and killed a similar number of people, slightly more, about four million people. The price that was paid for feeding the Chinese armies that fought on the Allied side was the lives of those four million Chinese peasants who were forced to give up their grain. Everywhere terrible atrocities on both sides and terrible bargains and dilemmas made, which make the story of China's resistance a very, very tragic one. But instead, what I want to do is just to give you two or three examples of things happening in wartime China, which have, I think, an immense significance for changing and shaping modern China and making it what it is today. And to do that, I'd like to start with the first example, which is, again, a massive problem that until recently has never had the attention from historians that it should have done, the huge refugee flight that shaped wartime China. And I've mentioned almost in passing that um, over the course of um, the war, China suffered immense refugee flights. But let me give you some details by just reading to you from the archives at the Yale Divinity Library, the story of one refugee, a lady called Mrs. Yang, uh, a Chinese Christian as it happens, who was one of many tens of thousands who when the Japanese invaded Eastern China in summer of 1937, prepared for evacuation along with her husband and her children. On the 16th of November, 1937, Mrs. Yang set out, and she recorded this in her diary later, carrying with her only a few essentials. Uh, two big turnips, 
which might not sound terribly essential, except they were actually hollowed out with 200 banknotes actually hidden inside. And again, an egg, which was carefully designed uh, to have the, the interior blown out, and some jewelry was hidden inside that. The party had to make a whole variety of terrifying choices. Should they flee up the Grand Canal, one of China's great waterways you'll see on the, uh, the eastern side of the, uh, the country, uh, a very obvious route where they might be attacked by the Japanese, or across the nearby lake? If they chose the Grand Canal, they'd be close to the railways, and the Japanese bombers were hitting the railways with bombs on a regular basis during that autumn of 1937, as the city of Shanghai fought and fell. But if they went via the lake, bandits and robbers would quite likely grab anything that they, uh, that they had. And as she put it in her diary, robbery meant death too. A sudden sighting of bombers ahead forced them to choose, but when they took the Grand Canal route, they in Mrs. Yang's words, met thousands of people, rich and poor, in small fishing boats just like ours, fleeing from their homes. The Grand Canal was simply jammed with boats. And then amongst the horrors that Mrs. Yang and her family saw were, in her words, dead bodies on the shore, dead babies in the river, and bombed ships sunk here and there. She went on, every boat was so crowded, it was almost impossible for us to move. They all, of course, had to share just the one basin for washing, and again, in her words, sometimes a mother would almost suffocate her baby in order to stop the noise from reaching the soldiers' ears. They finally reached the city of Zhenjiang, 220 kilometers northwest, uh, on 22nd of uh, November. They managed to fight their way onto a British steamer that was still operating after an air raid. Constant reality of life during that period uh, had interrupted boarding. Um, the boat was not keen on them getting on. They sprayed them with sort of the equivalent of water cannons, uh, very... Uh, 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 with hoses. Um, as Mrs. Young said, we were as wet as ducks, but they still managed to get on board, unlike others, as she said. Thousands who were left on the bridge were in despair. Many of them got on board by throwing away all their possessions and even their children. They then traveled for four days on the railway through a rather circuitous route. Uh, the trains also, again, were a scene of immense turmoil. Again, in Mrs. Young's word, after staying at the station for seven hours, the train arrived at 11 o'clock at night. Because we were unfortunate enough to be standing at the place where the first class trains, uh, carriage stopped, of course they didn't have first class tickets, we ran to third class, but many of us were almost overtrodden to death. And even with those, those with children and the old ladies had to find people to help them. I missed three people in my family and feared they might have been hustled down to the railway track. But until the next morning, I found that the lost people came in to look for us. And eventually the journey went on and on. By January of the next year, 1938, they were now trying a third mode of transport, trucks which um, brought their own salvation, but also the smell of the gasoline made Mrs. Young and her family nauseous so much, as she said, that I could not suppress myself from vomiting. I opened my eyes and poured out all that I ate, and another passenger immediately followed. So just one vignette there of the lives of tens of hundreds thousands of people just during that period, and millions during the entire spate of the, uh, the length of the, the war. It's estimated, and the statistics are difficult to follow in some ways because, of course, nobody was keeping very careful statistics in the middle of a war, but that 80 to 100 million Chinese might well have had experiences in some part of China during this sort, uh, during this time. And even in a country with the population size of China, that's one in six, one in seven of the entire population at that time. Having, in many cases, followed a way of life that had changed only gradually over years, um, focused on ritual, agriculture, and stability, this war suddenly plunged thousands of people into a sense of destruction of their, all of the communities that they had known. So let me then move on to talking about one particular community that these changes happened in a microcosm, but a very concentrated, furnace-like crucible of change. And that was the city I've mentioned before, down here in the southwest of China on the map, Chongqing, or Chongqing, the temporary wartime nationalist capital of China, where the issues of trauma, dislocation, and the destruction and recreation of the Chinese state had to be worked on. Now, this was a moment that, at the time, was, on the, uh, was in the eyes of the world. Even the American journalist Theodore White, who would later become a great critic of Chiang Kai-shek, declared that the defense of Chongqing during those years was, in his words, an episode shared by hundreds of thousands of people who had gathered in the shadow of its walls out of the faith 
in China's greatness and an overwhelming passion to hold the land against the Japanese. And he astutely saw what others saw, that the nature of society in wartime China had changed a great deal because of the sudden unexpected nature of the conflict. And the changes would ultimately, of course, lead to the downfall of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and the rise of the Chinese Communist Party, particularly the wartime change to a more collective way of living with more demands on the state. And this was something very notable because Chongqing, Chongqing itself was a pretty backward city at that time. It wasn't entirely without development, but it's stuck at the top of two cliffs, uh, uh, sorry, of cliffs and at the confluence of two rivers, which means it's accessible by water, but not so easily by land because of the topography of the territory. And that makes it very defensible as a last, uh, as a last redoubt. But what it meant was that the city, although safe from a land attack by the Japanese, was very vulnerable from the air. And this sort of scene became a regular occurrence in wartime China. You see there, airtime damage in the city of Chongqing. During the years 1938 to 1943, hundreds of raids took place over Chongqing from Japanese bombers, killing uh, some 12,000 people and destroying many tens of thousands of homes and properties. And the necessity to recreate a society and a state in the face of this kind of air raid damage is again one of the huge challenges to nationalist China. But it's never, I think, been sufficiently understood as one of the reasons why China's modern state developed as it, uh, uh, as it did. During this period, some 25,000 skilled workers, around 450 factories, were moved into the interior up the Yangtze River. And if we've talked about the, the idea of a Chinese long march, a term which I'm sure you know from the history of the long Communist. sail up the river Yangtze, 800 miles, to bring these wartime factories of workers to Chongqing, is also equally worthy of note. But during this period, much greater numbers were found of refugees. I've mentioned figures of 80 to 100 million. Some 10 million of those alone were the officially registered refugees in and around the areas of nationalist control close to Chongqing. Um, and over 5 billion Chinese dollars were spent during the war in dealing with their, uh, their needs. But this led again to a very profound change in China, which once again gives you a clue in the path towards ultimate communist victory. And that's expressed in this document here. It comes from the Chongqing Municipal Archive, and it's a very specific document that is a report from one of the Chongqing Food Management Committees dealing with the impact of air raid damage on someone's property. And up at the top, you see this sort of row of characters. It's different items that have been lost by this particular air raid victim. You can see things there if you read Chinese saying, there's some shoes, there's a quilt, there's a bed, very homely, very everyday pieces of property. Underneath listed the original monetary value of these items, what happened to them, and this line that runs across the middle of the page basically says they've all been completely uh, destroyed. Oh, Carlos can read all this, of course. Um, and this is basically a report which is trying to deal with the fact that for the first time, the Chinese government is taking responsibility in some minimal sense, but real responsibility for the air raid damage that people are suffering and the need to give them relief and rehabilitation afterwards. In other words, the increasing of the role of the state in people's welfare at the same time that st the state is demanding much more from them, particularly conscription of the men in the war against the uh, Japanese. But it's not just about men. One of the interesting sets of documents I found in the archives were about efforts to mobilize women activists during this time, and one despairing activist claimed the following thing. It's even more difficult to train women than it is regular people, which I think means men, uh, as it uh, goes. Apparently women are not regular people. Women are conservative, and their outlooks are rooted in clan and countryside. They don't understand the meaning of our war of resistance against Japan or its future. Women's production work and work at home just takes up all of their time. They need more chances to participate in social activities and national reconstruction to do with the war. So again, here an agenda which changed during the war in terms of trying to get women's issues, including health, vaccination, childcare um, issues and so forth, very much at the front of the agenda. Something that in the mid 1940s, in the middle of the war, might be regarded in some ways as quite progressive. And as I'm pointing out, not in this case a product of the communist revolution, but of the nationalist wartime effort. Also, of course, a, um, a moment when 
China becomes a huge player on the world stage. It is, of course, officially an ally along with the British and the Americans against Japan, not the Soviets, who, of course, remain neutral in the war against Japan until August 1945. And one of the most important products of that Chinese wartime uh, participation in the alliance is still with us today in the 21st century in 2014. If you want to ask, as many policymakers and political journalists do in India today, why does China have a seat on the UN Security Council permanently and India does not? The answer is two words or one name, and that name is Chiang Kai-shek. Because of China's participation in World War II as a direct result, President Roosevelt insisted on inserting China as one of the five countries that would eventually have, to this day, permanent five Security Council seats on the UN Security Council. If you want to annoy a Chinese diplomat, and hey, who doesn't, just try reminding him that his permanent seat in New York at the UN and all the privileges that go with it were there because of the nationalist leader who Mao defeated in the Civil War in 1949. But the conversation may not last very long after you've done that. Let me lead on to the last point that I want to make in this context, which was the move towards a society that was simultaneously one where more people demand, Chinese people demanded more from their government, and the government tragically proved massively inadequate to providing those needs. Because as I've mentioned, the emergence of welfareism, the idea that more should be done for the population as a whole by the state, was actually a very big one in China at the time. Uh, my former postdoctoral uh, researcher, Dr. De Yun Ma, um, wrote a brilliant article about what the Chinese nationalists thought of the beverage plan, the British social welfare document that you know, went viral, as we now say, say today, in terms of welfare state creation. Until she'd written that article, I don't think many people in the world, in China or in Britain, knew that the nationalists had ever thought about the British uh, welfare state system or national health and other issues that followed from it. But actually, it emerges that there was a genuine transnational interest uh, from the Chinese point of view in all of these issues. There was even the discussion of the setting up of a national health service in China, which would provide free care, although I think it would not have been anything like as uh, extensive as the system set up in Western social democracies. Most of the assessments of what the nationalist government wanted from its wartime victory have been limited for the simple reason, understandable, that the communists eventually won the civil war just a few years later. So who cares what the nationalists really thought? People have gone back to this vision in recent years for a very simple reason, which is that China today, which has a communist party running it, but which is not really communist in terms of its ideology. It's, uh, it uh, has a whole variety of ideological directions, including uh, a fervent sort of turbo capitalism in terms of its domestic politics. In this period, it is the policies of their predecessors, the nationalists, that in some ways seem to have more similarity than anything that happened under Chairman Mao. So to finish off this, this thought about why if all of these interesting, I hope interesting, visions of social welfare change and geopolitical prominence were so big in the minds of Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist Chinese, why didn't they win? Why didn't this vision come to fruition? How did the communists come to power? And the fact is that these visions, important though they were, stood at the same time as China being a desperately impoverished country that was battered almost into smithereens by the effects of eight years of war, four and a half years of which until Pearl Harbor, they had fought almost entirely alone. There were many accusations, many of them entirely justified, that tried to downplay any merit in the nationalist government on the grounds that it was black marketeering, it was corrupt, it was hugely abusive of human rights. All of these things were entirely true. But again, some proportion is important. In terms of corruption and embezzlement, the total amount of international financial assistance, mostly provided through the American Lend-Lease program given to China, was compared to the other allies, the British Empire and the Soviet Union, absolutely tiny. In the most um, uh, extensive year that Lend-Lease assistance was given to China, only 1.5% of the entire Lend-Lease budget went to the Chinese, much of which actually didn't go to the Chinese at all, but went here to British India, where it was sort of held up uh, uh, at the Calcutta docks, so to, uh, so to speak. In other years, the amount was even less than 
Chiang Kai-shek was often uh, nicknamed by uh, Americans who wearied of rumors of corruption of his, uh, of his government. He was always often nicknamed Cash My Check because of his uh, constant demands for American money. But one has to also admit that the checkbook was maybe not quite as extensive as it might have been. In the end, Chiang Kai-shek's rhetoric of a nation state which needed to be united in a war of resistance to the end, in his phrase, was uh, an inspiring one in some senses, but expectation was vastly outrun by reality and ultimately became disillusioned. Resistance by the Chinese was real. Resistance by the nationalist Chinese in particular was very real. They fought many more, the vast majority of the set piece battles against the Japanese. But the price of that victory, such as it was, was famine and starvation, massive corruption, and hyperinflation in the last years of war in China, making it hard to paint it as a glorious victory and an entry point for the communists. The crippled and unsympathetic nationalist regime that limped to peace in 1945 was a country that I think in the end was inevitably gonna fall to the better trained and ideologically more dynamic communist party, and so it did fall four years later in 1949. But it was not in that state. It had not degenerated simply because of blind anti-communism or what many Americans at the time claimed and communists have claimed, communist Chinese have claimed afterwards, which was a supposed refusal to fight Japan. A very odd thing to say considering the nationalists have done almost all the resistance in China for four and a half years from 1937 to 1941 before the West um, made any entry into China or even because of foolish or primitive military thinking. It was also overwhelmed by an external attack from Japan, domestic dislocation, and very uncertain Western assistance, none of which it could have done anything very much about. China's modernization then as now was based on some fundamental necessities, stability. The government wanted a government that was politically independent and which had full but equal trading relationships with the outside world. It needed a stable tax base, a government that penetrated throughout society and was recognized throughout China as a means of keeping the population stable, healthy, and productive. Its attempts to do this before the war were flawed in myriad ways, but the war against Japan made it almost impossible that it would succeed, leading to the eventual victory of Mao. And in the last two or three minutes, Carlos, as we get to one two, leaving time for uh, questions, I want to just speak for a couple of minutes about why all of this past history has reappeared, having not been very prominent for the last half century or more. The role of the nationalists essentially fell into a sort of historical black hole after the war for many decades, first because nobody in communist China had any interest in saying anything other than the, uh, the most negative um, assessment of the nationalists, but also because the West found the nationalists, understandably, an embarrassing ally because of the corruption, the inability of the state to recover itself after the war, and therefore there was little motivation to try and um, recover that particular part of, uh, of, uh, of history. Much of the part of the history was written in the black and white of the Cold War certainties rather than the shades of gray, which I think it requires. But by the 80s, after the death of Mao, after the Nixon visit to China, and after the ultimate breakdown of the Cold War as a whole, various things happened. Maoism was no longer popular after the Cultural Revolution's failure. There was a desire to reunify with Taiwan and a feeling that bringing up the nationalist element of history in a more positive way in the mainland might actually be a good thing to do. And also the desire to be a little tougher on Japan than they had been during the Cold War and remind them of their war crimes. And that led to things like this. 2005, the 60th anniversary of the end of the war, a television program shown on local Chongqing television, uh, the local Chongqing television station, celebrating the achievement at the end of the war, not of three, but four great allies. As you see there, the pictures, uh, the Houses of Parliament in London, the Red Square clock in Moscow, the US Capitol building, and on the right, the Liberation Anti-Japanese Monument, which is still there today in the center of Chongqing, symbolizing China, that forgotten ally. I should say, and Carlos again will know this, that the Chongqing Liberation Monument is not in fact twice as high as the US Capitol building, as this picture would suggest. Um, that was, I think, a piece of uh, Chinese boosterism that uh, was placed there. The war, to make my very final point, 
is still very much with us in China today, not just in terms of its legacy of that unresolved ongoing question of what the bargain is between state and society, but also in international relations. Most of you, all of you perhaps, will know that China and Japan are in dispute today over islands in the East China Sea, almost halfway between, known if you're Japanese as the Senkaku, Diaoyu if you're from the mainland. If you're from Taiwan, you call them the Diaoyu Tai, that's another, another issue. And in the last couple of months, the Chinese have pulled a particular weapon out of their legalistic armory to try and gain sovereignty over the islands. They've been quoting a treaty which claims that um, uh, islands taken by the Japanese need to be given back, by, uh, back to the Chinese. That treaty was signed in Cairo in 1943 by Chiang Kai-shek. In other words, yet again, the geopolitics of 2014 are reaching back to those far off days, maybe not so far off, when China in World War II was the forgotten ally. Carlos, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Um, we have 10 minutes for questions. Just one question. I might take a couple and then bring them back, all three. Uh, thanks, Rana, for a very enlightening discourse. Uh, I just wanted your assessment of uh, Communist One. Would, would Tibet have been different in case uh, the Nationalists had won? You mean if they won the Civil War? Okay. You want to take a couple more, Carlos, and then I can. sort of revengeful uh, mindset will take them too far or, or very far? Okay. Do one more and then we'll go very quick. Maybe three and then. Yeah. One more. You just mentioned So a sign of corruption by the national Yeah, it's a potential corruption or, uh, uh, or rather not agreeing with the previous idea. Okay, yeah, 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 gotcha, thanks. Okay, three excellent questions, thank you very much. The first, what if the, I mean, short and sweet, what if the nationalists had won the civil war against the communists in 1949? Now, I think actually, and again, I go into some detail in this in the, uh, in the, in the book, which is uh, available here, um, they, uh, I think it would have been very difficult for them to have won the military and political infrastructure of China had become so degenerated by the war against Japan by that stage that it's very hard to see a scenario by which Chiang Kai-shek could have recovered. But if they had done, then I think the entire shape of East Asia would have been different. If you remember what happened after Potsdam, after Yalta, and in this period of global state-making in Eurasia after World War II, nationalist China would have been uneasily but broadly allied with the United States. But Japan would also have still been essentially an American protectorate. Stalin had essentially at that stage said, I'm going to do Eastern Europe, Asia, you know, he was interested, but then he decided that he wasn't going to interfere. So Mao's indigenous revolution, which Stalin for a brief while didn't actually support, he, you know, betrayed the communists early in the in Civil War and then went back and gave them arms, um, could have led to an entirely US-oriented East Asia which would have led to a very different version of the Cold War, which would have been much more centered almost certainly in Europe. So that's one geopolitical consequence there might have been. In terms of the other two uh, questions that come up here, let me combine the two of them. Um, the way in which China is trying to use the past um, to make current claims and what they think about those earlier treaties. I mean, on the one hand, to answer the second question first, uh, to answer the second question first, you've got Second question first, then uh, we would say that um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the 1943 treaty is being used instrumentally 
It's not that the Chinese Communist Party have any great love for Chiang Kai-shek per se, but the treaty plays a useful role because it contains, I'm sorry, I said treaty. It's actually a communique. It isn't a formal treaty, which is one of the reasons why it's legally dubious in international, uh, international law. But it does give um, a point to the Chinese, one of which I think is justifiable and one isn't. The justifiable one is that they do want much more acknowledgement of the fact that they made this massive contribution to defeating the Japanese in Asia, which the Americans also did and therefore got geopolitical power from it. China feels it hasn't had its due, but it can't use it simply to push through any desired results that it wants, particularly against the Japanese. The one does not follow from the other. Well, um, I think our time is up, but uh, let's oh. please join me again in thanking Professor Ryan Mender for a great, great talk. Uh, thank you. We wish to thank Rana Mitter and Carlos Rojas.